All right, welcome back from the break. So now we're going to talk the same concept only on the other side of the table. And this is how a seller would receive the offer from a buyer. Once again, this is talking from the standpoint of an agent and what you would need as an agent. All right. So how do you receive the offer? Well, what I mean by this is we all know that you're going to probably receive it via email now. So I'm not really talking about physically. What I'm talking about is what, how was it communicated to you from the buyer? If the buyer did the job they were supposed to, like we talked about in the last section, they have probably communicated a lot of information on top of what is physically written. You know, is the buyer well qualified? Well, you got a pre-approval letter, but if the agent has told you some other stuff about, hey, you know, they bought and sold, uh, they're fairly, uh, <clears throat> whatever they tell you, you got to hear that. Now, what documents are you going to receive? Well, let's go back to the same list. It's the same list that you need to make sure. And typically just to make sure and be a professional, when I receive an offer, I always communicate back to the uh, listing or to the selling agent, hey, I received your offer that included a purchase agreement, two addendums, and the pre-approval letter. We did not get the lead-based paint or the seller's disclosure so that the selling agent can go, oh crap, I forgot. I didn't attach those two, or you're confirming exactly what they got. And you're obviously going to get the purchase agreement. You're going to get any of the addendums. And then you will know if you have a lead based paint, because you are the one that had your seller at least created from the onset. You're going to get back the seller's disclosure and you're going to get a pre-approval. Hopefully. So I always communicate to back to the selling agent. Hey, I got your offer that included the purchase agreement, two addendums. I did not see the lead based paint or the seller's disclosure. Did you download them from the listing or do you have a copy of them? Because we need them. That could make a difference. And once again, you're either corroborating to the list uh, selling agent that he didn't send them or he thought he did and he didn't and he, you have just helped him from avoiding a huge mistake. So when you receive that offer, you should acknowledge what you received, not just, hey, I got the offer because all of a sudden you get a purchase agreement and your seller goes no and declines it. You go back to the other side and go, hey, we've rejected your offer. And he's like, well, yeah, but we did this and this and this. And you're like, well, I never got those. All right. So it's important for you to acknowledge what you got. Now we can go back to the other side and actually say when you communicate to the listing agent, I'm sending you an offer it will include these five documents. Then the seller knows in his acknowledgement to look for those five to make sure, yep, hey, I got them. There's one, two, three, four, and we got the fifth one. Yep, got, we got your offer and, and uh, complete. So make sure that when you receive the offer that you actually got the true offer and all of the documents because that could be a key component as to whether your seller accepts or even entertains the offer altogether. All right. One of the things that when you go to present the offer to the seller is you want to try and stay impartial, even though the buyer's job was to try and sway you or the buyer's agent's job that we talked about a minute ago, you kind of want to stay impartial so that you are not. And it's kind of funny when you hear this, because here I'm telling you on this side of the table, you try not to pay too much attention to what the buyer's telling you. And I told you on the buyer side that you want to try and pump your offer up, especially the motivation, 
because one of the things the listing agent has got to do is kind of stay impartial. Now that doesn't mean that the listing agent can't be factual and say, I've got three offers, this one's cash, these two have financing without really being slighted because that's the truth, all right? So keep that in mind that when you're presenting it to your seller, you might want to cover certain things like what's the price? What was the earnest money? One of the bad things, let me back up before we go through this. One of the things you shouldn't do is forward the offer and say, hey, let me know what you think. I'll talk to you later. I'm going golfing. That's not your job. That's not professionalism, all right? You need to guide your client through the offer so that in case he gets a misconception of what they're saying, you can be there to straighten it out and go, no, what he's really saying is this. Now, if neither one of you know what the guy is saying, you could potentially call the selling agent and get, get a clarification. Hey, what did you mean when you said the second Thursday after the first Monday, followed by a full moon, all right? But you would probably want to discuss the price of each offer. You're gonna to wanna to discuss the earnest money because like I said, that could be important. You wanna talk about the title work they're asking for, which 99.95% of the time is gonna be that general warranty deed because most people don't really key in on that. Are there any contingencies that you have seen or conditions that the offer had that you better make sure your client sees so that they understand, oh, you've offered me full price. I'll take the offer. And you go, wait a minute, did you see the uh, condition or the provision that they're asking for 3% concession to pay the buyer's closings? Because then it's not a full price, it's actually 97%. So you need to key in on these things and um, especially conditions, contingencies, any provisions, any of the addendums, you might wanna make sure the seller gets as well. You received them, make sure the seller gets them. So make sure the seller also gets all of the documents. Typically that's not hard because you just forward the email, but you better call that a, uh, client behind that or text them or carrier pigeon or smoke signals or Facebook so that they know they actually have an offer in their uh, inbox, so to speak. So when you present that, you should go through the offer with them. And it could be by phone, it could be in person. I know some agents that call their sellers and say, hey, I've got an offer, can I bring it over? And they will literally go to the house and meet with them and show it. Now, that sometimes may not be practical because you've got a seller, oh, I'm at work, I don't get off till five, and you're like, dude, they gave us four hours to answer, hot market, or it's a very simple, so there could be an issue with that, so sometimes you may have to go over it with the phone, over the phone, and you could literally do that. Call and say, hey, I sent you an offer, can you pull it up, print it out, let's go through it real quick, and tell you what I see, and you tell me what you think about it. And therefore you would then go through, Here, here's the listing price, here's the earnest money, here's their closing date, and here's some of the things that they are asking for. Did you notice they're asking for 3%? Did you notice they're asking for a home warranty? Did you notice that we've only got four hours to answer? All right, so when you go through that or present it, you should go through that contract line by line so that they understand what this true offer is. You have explained the listing agreement to them, but this may be the first purchase agreement they've ever seen. So once again, you may go through each purchase agreement line by line and go, yes, that there is their offer. No, that's not their offer. That's their earnest money of 2,500. Their offer is right above that, all right? So don't laugh. I have seen sellers that have never seen uh, purchase agreements. Remember all these first time home buyers that everybody likes to deal with? Oh, I want to deal with first time home buyers. Eventually they're going to then become first time home sellers. So you've got to treat them just like you would a first time home buyer. Somebody that has never sold a home may not have ever seen a purchase agreement from the seller's side. Now they wrote one, 
when they bought, but they're still going to look at it differently. Trust me, uh, if you've ever bought or sold an own personal property, sitting on this side of the table, that offer looks different than it does sitting on that side. And it's the same words and the same numbers, but they look different. The next concept you have to worry about, and we touched on was that whole appraisal thing. Everybody would love to get an offer for $12.8 million on their house, but you need to be realistic and go, hey dude, that's probably your house isn't going to appraise. Think back to that example we talked a long, long time ago. I valued your house through a CMA at 140 to 149. We chose 149.9 to list at. We got an offer at 167. Your seller is going to be elated, but he has to be calmed by the next words out of your mouth are, that offer looks extremely high and I just want to warn you that, that the appraisal may not come in at that number. And if it doesn't, we then will have to negotiate down to a number that the appraiser came at. Unless the, the buyer has said we will pay the overage. So there is a caveat to this, all right? Even though the offer may have come in high, and you think, hey, it won't approach for this number. If the seller said, hey, we're writing you an offer above value because our mother lives next door, we really want the house, and we will pay the overage 100% above the appraisal, that could be a different story, all right? If they don't say that and you get a normal purchase agreement, remember line 37, I think it's 35, 36, 37, right in there, it says something to the effect that if the uh, agreed upon sales price is above the appraisal, either party can walk away or renegotiate the value. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I know a agent does or used to do as a trick, and it could potentially border on unethical. I do not advise this concept but I advise you to look out for this because as you know, not everybody in this business is as ethical as you are or I am. And here is a trick that some agents have played. They have intentionally priced their offer above the value or the list price solely to win the bid competition and are counting on the appraiser to be the bad guy so that the seller then has to lower the price back to the appraised value and what better buyer to work with than the one that's already under contract. So let me run that back by you one more time so you can see what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is there is a chance that your value is here or your list price. And what I'm telling you somebody may do is way overbid to make sure that your seller picks this person. And then when the appraisal comes in here, this buyer goes, oh, uh, oh okay, well, we, we'll lower back down to there. And they won the bid over all of these other bids that may have been here because they tricked the seller into believing that was going to be the final sales price. Like I said, that to me could border on unethical, unprofessional. So you would never do that because you are an ethical person. I would never do that. Some people might. So just keep that in mind. And that all, once again, let's go back to that. Once again, that all depends and goes back to if they are agreeing to pay that overage, that's maybe a whole different story. Maybe they truly do want to win and their mother lives next door and they are willing to pay that and they are willing to pay that 100% of the overage and they write that in the purchase agreement. That could be a different story. If they don't write that in, watch out for that potentially unethical trick there, all right? Um, the response time frame that you are given, once again, we go back to, we can go back to this curve, 
But the reality of this curve now becomes three-dimensional, and I don't even know if you guys want to get into this. Because what you have is the probability that you're going to say yes versus the hair versus the time frame, and your curve looks like something like that. That's supposed to be three-dimensional coming out into this series, meaning if it has a little hair and a short time frame, all right, versus a lot of hair and a short time frame, it could be different. So keep that in mind when you get that, that time versus hair concept. Um, are you going to respond quickly? Well, probably not if it's got a lot of degree of difficulty as opposed to something else. Now, that's not a law. There is no rule for that. You might agree to something with a lot of hair in a short time frame if your buyer's, or I'm sorry, if the seller's very intelligent, very experienced, he might be able to read through that in a minute or two and go, yeah, I, I get what they're saying and I'm willing to do that because the price is uh, a good price or I'm not willing to do that. Um, so think about that. There's an old adage about you can't steal in slow motion. So that goes back to the curve. Somebody that's trying to steal all cash gives you a short time frame. They can't steal in slow motion, so they got to steal quickly. All right. Any questions on this 30 hour post licensing course? We've looked at the offer and the counter offer, and these both go the simultaneously the same. Counter offers are the same concept. You know, what did you send back as a counter? Uh, what documents went back with it? You might convey that you received the counter and you've got all the pages so that everybody understands and sees to make sure that all of the documents are transmitted. So we've talked about the offer and the counter offer, both from the seller side and the buyer side. We're gonna come back and talk a little bit more here in just a minute.